Right, the sponsor video to uh, Fred Burton at Stratfor, I don't know if you can see this in the corner of the, the screen, but I'm, I'm probably not going to link his video because a lot of the information I have may not be relevant to the entire Stratfor audience, and I'm not trying to hijack their channel. But I think you should probably watch their videos. If there's a, if there's a channel I recommend on a lot of stuff, I, I would recommend them. Uh, although you may w not want to watch every single one of their videos because obviously they're not all going to be relevant to ordinary, regular American civilian life and a lot of stuff. And it's definitely a problem if you're not involved in a big international scene. And, and I'm definitely not in the game these days. Um, but I try to keep track of it to some level. And of course I'll comment on it here on YouTube. But if you're not a major player in a big international scene and get too wrapped up in it, then and it absorbs a uh, inordinate portion of your life, then you're you're probably not getting other stuff done. I'm taking a few minutes out of uh, some other stuff I'm handling. I was watching this video because it was short, about four minutes, where he talked about um, two data mining resources that are very commonly used by about everybody these days, which is Facebook and LinkedIn. Now, what we do know is that they're both relatively easy for at least government agencies to compromise whatever user controls are on there. Uh, I learned a few months ago that also the YouTube user controls can be compromised. Uh, there was somebody harassing me on my channel, basically really trying to elicit incriminating comments with regards to uh, something that happened uh, involving Alex Anser, a guy I used to be associated with. Uh, I believed that uh, he had stolen a lot of tools from my truck. I, I, I still believe that. Uh, however, he, he basically lawyered up and called the police on me. Uh, he created a circumstance which was engineered to put me on the defensive, and he wasn't working alone on that. Uh, there were other individuals that were badgering me on YouTube. I tried to ban them from my channel, and it wouldn't work. They were able to disable the controls and keep questioning me and, and, and placing or questioning harassing comments. Now one of the things I noticed is that a regular YouTube troll is usually going to cross the line into making threats. Uh, we saw this with the people at Troy at the uh, do-it-yourself world where they were actually driving. They, they had figured out where he lived. They were driving to the, the edge of the property. Uneducated people, people who weren't legally savvy, uh, would tend to cross that line. I believe they crossed that line. Uh, Troy said he reported the violations of some law enforcement agencies, and of course nothing was done about it. Uh, priorities, whether it's in the executive protection world, law enforcement world, uh, when you depend only on law enforcement for your protection, you know, you're getting you're getting the the watered down welfare version of of protection when you're de depending on the government services for protection and a lot of times it's just a matter of after the fact they're going to give you some flat advice and say what you should have done I kind of feel that's a little bit to a level of where Fred Burton was at on LinkedIn and Facebook where it's like okay thank you very much the information a bad guys used to get at me must have come from uh, LinkedIn and Facebook uh, I, I practice compartmentalized communication, for example, different computers, different uh, cell phones, different email addresses for different groups of people. I'm going to have a pretty good idea what direction something's coming from, uh, what circle of stuff is coming from if it happens in that regard. Um, when somebody did a theft from a vehicle of mine and demonstrated a high level of familiarity with the layout of the vehicle, that list was really small. When I started to question people, one person acted extremely suspiciously, but what also intrigued me on this was that as it progressed, it was obvious that they had some professional level legal cons consultation, and it became obvious that somebody was using the threat of knowing where I lived, what, how, what, what I did for a living, uh, a lot of information. Uh, threatened to disclose other information which would endanger myself and my family, uh, would endanger my roommates. On top of threatening to disclose that information, there was uh, a chorus of demands that I get raided by the police. Uh, in, in fact, the type of demands they were making was the type of demands that would cause me to get raided by a SWAT team. Uh, it's a tactic of what I call the Stuchka class, which was a, a class of people in the Soviet years in Russia were 
basically state-sponsored criminals to a level. These people would commit crimes that were allowed to commit crimes against people who, for whatever reasons, are disenfranchised by the state. And so there tend to be this type of a relationship between the Stuchka and the state. The Stuchka would carry out the dirty work. Uh, these were the guys, not necessarily direct employees of the KGB or, or, or GRU or one of the agencies, but they tended to be the dirty work guys. Um, and they would support themselves quite often through criminal means. That's why it was very cost effective for a police state to allow certain classes of criminals to, active, to, to be active, you know, especially in victim crime where the victims are those who have been disenfranchised by the state or, or carry a disenfranchised status of some sort. Um, in finding victims, we also have to realize that in certain foreign countries such as Mexico and, and parts of Latin America, where kidnapping for ransom is a business, it's an industry, a lot of that is an intelligence-driven industry because when they go to nab somebody, they want to be able to grab somebody where there's a high likelihood of a ransom being paid. Um, they want to be able to grab somebody under circumstances of very little danger to those who are doing the kidnapping and under circumstances where there is little or no danger of retaliation. So they're going to start profiling stuff and they're going to gather information for that. Now, Mr. Burton talks about Facebook and LinkedIn, and definitely those are going to be used. Uh, LinkedIn is a professional website where people tend to use the real names. They tend to talk about where they work or where they could work, and there's a lot of work-related stuff. It's a fast and furious version of information that would be on job applications. Now, job applications are something where a lot of people are... Uh, told that there's a need to give up to tremendous amounts of personal information, uh, tremendous amounts of personal identifying information, a lot of that, to people on the simple virtue of the fact that they are or may be shopping for labor in the labor market. Uh, you know, one of the ways I've recommended people get around that is through self-employment. Okay, They get a business card, maybe use LinkedIn to say here's a line of work you're in or, or that sort of a thing. Uh, one of the things I do to talk about you know what I'll do to make a living or, or things I do is I, I make YouTube videos. Uh, I've worked at an electrical company where they did told me that there was a policy against pictures and photographs at work, no social media from work, and it's a security matter. It was a security matter that benefits them from the standpoint that um, I can't prove that I work there. You know, I can't prove the type of work that I do unless I have pictures of it because I can sit across somebody in a job interview. In fact, I, I may be going to a job interview in the next day or two for a regular regular type job. And uh, I'm going to record it. I'm going to explain some of how this works. Uh, a lot of it has to do with the inability to verify certain levels of work when you might have an employer who gets you at a certain price range uh, maybe less than willing to verify your competence, level of work, what's done for an employer who would pay at a slightly higher price range. Uh, that's because they want to retain a good deal. Okay. Now, with regards to other types of profiling that's going to happen, and, there, and there's a lot of things where you got to make a living in the world, you've got to engage in the world to make a living, realize that government agency people don't. Okay, they're going to get their paycheck from, from the taxpayers. They get their paycheck from a non-consenting source uh, in a roundabout way, either directly or indirectly. The Stuchka class usually would get their money from a non-consenting source. And that's one of the danger things that you can look for is, does somebody make a living from a consenting source or do they make a living from a non-consenting source? If they make a living indirectly from a non-consenting source, that's another thing to be careful of. Uh, it means that their purpose for gathering intelligence information is probably nefarious. Now, when we look at people who would gain information from consenting sources, such as marketing information, uh, store affinity cards, things like that. You might get spammed with advertising, but it's mainly because one you, you have consented to do business with one group of people under a certain circumstance for certain goods and services. You might consent to other people with similar goods and services for whatever reason. That 
from what I've been able to tell, is usually not used very much for a hostile intelligence gathering. Uh, I've, I've not had any spam phone calls or anything from somebody who said, hey, I sell this new type of TV mount, can I have your credit card information or can we send you a sample and start doing business with you? And, and then it was fake. Uh, usually they're going to go for broke. You know, usually they're going to contact you and then they want you know, full information. They want a contract. They want something. A lot of that has to do with the fact that they're going to want some sort of a hold harmless agreement. They want something that gives them a little bit of legal cushion if they're caught doing what they're doing or if they're caught lying about the purpose of it. Um, other sources of information that a hostile organization can use is uh, a lot of stuff that Mr. Burton wasn't mentioning. One is LexisNexis. LexisNexis was, is available at colleges and universities. It's available on a paid basis on the internet. It's a, it predates the internet by, by or a couple of decades, I, I think. Um, LexisNexis is used by law firms and to a lesser degree these days by government agencies. In the old days, it used to be used a lot by government agencies. Uh, there's also a few government agency only uh, sources. Usually they're kind of going to be associated through, let's say, your DMV records, uh, voter records, things like that. Um, those are made available through agreements with foreign, a lot of times foreign law enforcement agencies, foreign intelligence agencies work like that, just like ours do. Uh, one of the one of the big criticisms of the California assault re weapon registration databases was that they were made available to the Mexican government. Uh, they were made available to the Mexican government because Mexican government claimed, uh, somewhat truthfully, that stolen guns were being smuggled from California into Mexico, and that was true. Unfortunately, if you're dealing with the Mexican government and dealing with Mexican law enforcement agencies, you are also dealing with the Mexican cartels. So by disclosing re gun registration information to them, you're also disclosing shopping lists to the people that work on their behalf. And they would simply, uh, using the addresses, sometimes security profiles and other information to gain access to things, uh, people's private property that they otherwise would not be able to gain access to. Uh, I became aware of a situation in Vallejo, California where there was a program through the Vallejo Police Department in 19, I believe it was 1988, uh, where they were actually, they had volunteers that had been conned into going door to door with a packet. They were targeting retirees and in this packet you would fill out and register all your valuables with the police department including guns, electronics, anything else. You registered your valuables with the police department. Then you would register uh, you'd be assigned, like, let's say, a type of a case handler with this volunteer or auxiliary organization that actually was connected with the police department. And they would, uh, and you could say, well, if you leave for the winter, you go south, you have more than one home, you could list when you're there and when you're not there. The idea was so that local community patrols could keep an eye on your place, have an extra eye on your place, maybe when people aren't supposed to be there. Those packets, those dossiers, were being sold to street gangs and other organized crime organizations in, in Vallejo, California. I had met a retired Navy guy who uh, had, had gotten a violent crime conviction because his house had been burglarized. Uh, he found out who did it. He, he used violence to interrogate the perpetrator and was able to gain the information on how the perpetrator and his organized crime group had gotten so much information about him, about the valuables that were in his house, when he was home, when he wasn't home. He had actually given that information away. When we talk about Fred Burton's ad advice, or the implied advice in his four minute video, uh, we're talking about Facebook and LinkedIn of somebody saying, listen, don't go give away information that would make yourself vulnerable. Well, in other aspects of it, if you're out trying to make a living in the consenting side of the economy, you, you've got to give contact information. You've got to have work, work contact information. Uh, different, different employers that work for me have different phone numbers. And that way, if I know one, one phone is ringing, I, I have an idea what line of work that that person wants to get a hold of me for. If another's ringing, I know that. 
there were some people that had more than one number and they started to abuse their ability to get a hold of me for you know low paying exploitive stuff when they knew I was probably busy with something that was better paying uh, I started to figure that out, start to figure out when to cut those people off. On the other hand, if you're talking about hostile agencies, you, you can't always blame a sophisticated thing on what you've given away on Facebook, MySpace, or YouTube. Uh, and a lot of that has to do with the fact that they can more easily access things like credit reports and certain government databases. If you see evidence of penetration into restricted information such as um, you know, your, your Facebook or MySpace or YouTube passwords or private videos or private stuff, you have to look at a compromised government agency as the source of that. If you're looking at access to information which you have hidden but not necessarily restricted, then you may be looking at a, at, at a security breach on your end. For example, I'm a member of a somewhat sexually oriented website with my profile, with my picture, those sorts of things. And it's, it's never been compromised even though it's not highly restricted. And a lot of it had to do with the fact that I simply never disclosed that to people outside of that circle of people. There was a lot of people that would speculate on that and then publish their or say their things. And it's interesting because when I see them publish something that's blatantly untrue or, or they couldn't come up with uh, compromise any, any of the girls that I've seen, then I know, oh, okay, I, I, uh, this is somebody who's trying a hostile act, and they actually never compromised it. At one time, somebody had gotten a hold of the cell phone of mine and tried to compromise a girl that I'd seen a few times. And the thing is, is she had programmed her phone number into my cell phone with one name, and when somebody would call that answering machine, it would be another name, and I would address her by yet a third name. Uh, when somebody said, hey, uh, Michelle has said this, 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 and that about you, and Michelle, and we're going to go get Michelle, and we're going to do this and that, I knew that this was somebody who had gotten a hold of a cell phone. Uh, they compromised the cell phone. They'd probably never compromised her. Those are all methods of determining where somebody's intelligence product came from. Uh, LinkedIn is definitely going to be a hostile intelligence source, but if you're in a situation where somebody's attempted to compromise you, try to compartmentalize what information goes where. Uh, and when you compartmentalize that information, you're going to get an idea of what direction the hostile action is coming from, or if this is simply somebody who's curious, let's say somebody who's considered hiring or something like that.